This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the friends of KUHF Houston. Today, black Americans give us a lesson in freedom. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Freedom is the other face of creativity. Freedom is a costly commodity. We enjoy so much freedom earned at bitter cost, yet we sell it off in little pieces. We give freedom away to convenience, to safety, and to security. That's true of creativity, too. Creativity is risk. It also entails the dangers of strange places, of daring to claim freedom of the mind. The Civil War laid the freedom issue before black Americans. Most northern whites thought dying for a cause was their birthright alone. Black Americans knew as no white could how costly freedom was. They clamored to join the fight. The Union Army didn't form black units until 1862. When they did, blacks poured in 180,000 of them. By war's end, a tenth of our army was black. 20% of them died, mostly from disease in their terrible segregated facilities, but they died in combat as well. 21 black soldiers received the Medal of Honor. One soldier, an escaped slave from Kentucky, said, When I donned my Union blues, I felt freedom in my bones. Yet the change from slave to free wasn't always immediate. A white commander of a black unit talked about getting rid of plantation manners, hat in hand with eyes averted. Maybe black soldiers had learned plantation manners under the whip, but they'd also honed a finely tempered inner core. One surprised officer said of his troops, they were so cool and wary in combat, you'd think wild turkeys were the only game. Northern draft rioters lynched blacks. Southern troops shot black prisoners. Black soldiers got less pay. They were shunted off into labor details. The movie Glory showed how they marched to a hero's slaughter at Fort Wagner. That happened again at Port Hudson and Petersburg. They triumphed in the battles of Milliken's Bend and Newmarket Heights. So the Civil War ended. White America soon forgot black heroism, yet something was left. War is a ghastly and questionable business, but it's also a great proving ground of the human heart. 140,000 surviving blacks had faced that cold moment, and they had not found themselves wanting. 140,000 men had gained what each of us must eventually gain. They'd found the knowledge of their own inner capacity that each of us must find, one way or another, if we ever hope to be whole. Today, the son of a slave brings high tech to sugarcane. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Norbert Rilliot was born in New Orleans in 1806. His mother was a slave and his father was her master. Not an uncommon situation in those days. Norbert's father freed his mother before the birth and took Norbert as his son. The boy was very bright, so his father sent him off to the École Centrale in Paris, where he studied engineering. He stayed on as an instructor for a few years, and he published papers on steam power. He also began working on a problem from back in Louisiana. The last thing you do when you make white sugar is to evaporate the water used in the refining process. That exacts a terrible cost in fuel. Norbert Rilliot put his knowledge of thermodynamics to work. He invented the first multi-stage evaporator. By evaporating and condensing at successively lower pressures, he used the heat over and over. It was a brilliant idea. But Rilliot was caught between two pernicious forces, racism in America and technological conservatism in Europe. He weighed the alternatives and went back to New Orleans to work on a prototype. It was the right decision at the right time. He patented the machine in 1846 and prospered for some time. He was very highly thought of as a process engineer, and his machine revolutionized sugar refining. Finally, though, as the institution of slavery strengthened before the Civil War, the racial situation got worse. 
Brilliot returned to France, and there he ran into prejudice of a different kind. Certain French engineers had misused his process. They made it look effective, and that hurt the good name he'd enjoyed as an engineer in America. He finally walked away from process engineering and took up archaeology. Author Robert Hayden tells us that a leading American sugar planter looked Rilio up in Paris in 1880. He found him in a library, translating Egyptian hieroglyphics. Still, his technical interest revived once more. At the age of 75, he patented another process, one that cut in half the cost of processing sugar beets. Yet when he died in Paris in 1894, his abiding disappointment was the French refusal to credit his invention of multi-stage evaporation. In the end, Europe finally did recognize it. In 1934, the international sugarcane technologists raised a memorial to this remarkable engineer. Norbert Rilliot's life suffered from prejudice on two sides, but he showed us a mind larger than the troubles assailing it. And today, Rilliot's evaporators are used for everything from desalting seawater to recycling processes in the space station. Today, a great city and a great civilization in the African forests. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The nation of Zimbabwe takes its name from an ancient masonry city called Great Jimbachwe. It's near Yanda, once called Fort Victoria. The bleached bones of this city tell us much about medieval African civilization. The ruins run for almost a mile. They weave about a cliff face and down into the valley below. These fine masonry husks were once buildings that served many functions. The center is the so-called Great Enclosure. It's the structure that was called a Zimbabwe. It's an outdoor amphitheater or temple. We walk the winding stone paths of the city through walls of beautifully set unmortared stone. We see what Europeans want to call an acropolis. We see dwellings. We're astonished at the reach of this empty city. It goes on and on. Carbon dating tells us more. Iron Age Rhodesians began the city after 200 AD. Then they abandoned it until the 9th or 10th century. The masonry went up in the 11th century, just before the Gothic cathedrals in Europe. The city lasted until colonialism and slavers had splintered African civilization. People still lived there 200 years ago. White souvenir hunters found Great Zimbabwe in the late 19th century. They savaged the place. We've had to reconstruct much of what we know from stolen relics in the museums of Europe and South Africa. The city was a great and peaceful trading center. We find no military fortifications. Here was art from all over the world. Ming Celadon, Nanking porcelain, Persian faience, and Arab glass. But the native art arrests our eye. Sculpture in soapstone and schist, objects of copper, iron, and gold. Then an even greater surprise. We move off into the forests of Rhodesia, Botswana, and even South Africa. What do we find? Great Zimbabwe is only one of hundreds of abandoned Zimbabwe's. This city was once the rule. It wasn't the exception at all. The Shona people who built the Zimbabwe's practiced a highly personal familial religion. Each Shona chieftain had a holy Zimbabwe. Tribal representatives gathered in them to hear their ancestors' spirits. So we gaze upon civilization of the highest order here. We see centers for art, dance, and human concourse. This and the other Zimbabwe's remind us how little we've seen of Africa when we've only expected to see jungle. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.